I had the pleasure of meeting you in Hong Kong, obviously, and I had to bring you back because I think it's so important for people to hear it. Uh, you mentioned Tyler a few times there. For people who don't know he, who he is, just yes. tell us a little bit about. So Tyler Schultz was also one of the whistleblowers who came forward and is on the record. There's actually a group of us of around eight, I would say, that originally came forward. Um, and he was the grandson of George Schultz, who was on the board of the directors for the, for the company. Incredible. And I mean, the challenges, tell me a little bit just about the experience of being there. How quickly did you realize at Theranos that something was terribly wrong? It took me about a month, a month a and month? a half. Yeah, Is that Thanksgiving. All? <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it was on Thanksgiving Day uh, that I realized that there was something. And what was Tyler's role? And did it bring you closer together, the fact that you had all these challenges and all this stuff being thrown at you? Yeah, so Tyler and I had initially worked in the same department, and we worked the night shift, so we were called like the ghost of Normandy because we were always there super late working in the lab. And so our journeys were really interlinked within the company, and it's definitely brought us together, and it's nice having an ally and sort of a supporter throughout this, this whole process. And it's Tyler that you have started the new operation with, am I right? Yes, so he's part of the founding team. I have another co-founder who's actually a lawyer, Luke Finn, um, but Tyler is also on the founding team and he helps us with that. And I'm just interested to know a little bit as well about the challenges for Tyler with his grandfather being, I mean, did he not go to his grandfather immediately and say, yeah. You know what you've got yourself into? So the backstory is actually Tyler and I quit a day apart from one another. And um, when I had had my conversation with Sonny uh, the day before, Tyler had a similar conversation explaining the errors that he had seen and what was going on. And the next day I had that conversation with Sonny. We both quit. And then we went to his grandfather's house to just pl try and plead to him that, look, what you're seeing is not what you're getting. Um, and his grandfather, at this point, still believed in Elizabeth. He wasn't quite trusting us in, in sort of our experience of, of what we had seen. Do you think there's an element of, um, I often think this happens, of youth, of because you were both so young? Yeah. That, I mean, despite the fact that you were well capable and qualified to see that something was terribly wrong, that it was hard to have your voice heard. Yeah, I, in, in part, and what the lawyers had told us is it's really a situation of David versus Goliath, right? Where we were really these small players that were trying to go up against a lot of really big players, and it would be a bit of a tough, tough battle. And what was, I mean, tell us a little bit about your reaction. I'm trying to imagine the day that that letter arrived from the lawyers to your friend's address. Yeah. What did it feel like? Were you terrified? I mean, the worst part was actually how I received that letter was they were sitting outside of my work all day and had freaked out my coworkers. So I didn't even realize they were sitting outside of my workplace, but my coworkers had come up to me because I was working late and they said, we're not letting you get out of this building alone. There's been this man that's been sitting in the parking lot all day and he's freaking us out. So they escorted me out and then the guy had basically physically handed me the letter. And so they, you know, of course I'm freaked out because I have this letter, but then when I opened it and saw the uh, address, that's when I really kind of broke and, and was very panicked from that point forward. And did you have lawyers that you knew or did somebody advise you? Like, I, I'm, I'm trying to think what I would do. Yeah, I had like no cash in the bank for, for lawyers <laughs> at this point. So it was a lot of calling of friends, of badgering like anyone who was in law school, who was a lawyer, who had a parent that was a lawyer, trying to get all the free advice I could possibly get. Um, but luckily, uh, the, the one strange thing about this case was the fact that I was 22, 23. And one lawyer had told me if they did actually sue me, it would go into the public record. And how were they going to explain why they were suing a recent graduate who was 22, 23? And hence why I played the just keep silent until you absolutely have to lawyer up and, and go to court. So. And tell us a little bit more about the actual whistleblowing process and who you went to and what their reaction was. Yeah, so the actual whistleblowing process, no one prepares you on how to do something like this. Like I had no idea that you could actually report to a regulatory agency until I had talked to the lawyer, but it was so simple. 
it was really simple. Like once, it's actually, they need to make it a little bit easier to figure out what number you call, because it's actually quite complicated. Um, but uh, all it is is, so for me, I was really concerned about staying anonymous, because we had signed these non-disclosure agreements and confidentiality agreements, and Theranos made it very, very clear that if we violated them, they would come after us. Um, but when I called the regulators, they said, yeah, you can just send an anonymous email. And at that point, I was like, oh, that's, that's so easy. Like, sending an email is, is, you know, that'll take no time whatsoever. So once I had figured out how to do that and actually sent over the email, I had tried to recruit a bunch of other former employees to send in other complaints who were a bit more qualified, they had more expertise in the space. And um, honestly, if I had known how to do, it, do that sooner, I would have done it a, a quite, quite a long ways back. Because it's interesting because, you know, if you look at Silicon Valley and you look at other products and other sectors, it may not, it, it may be a little bit different, but a sector like this, you're actually talking about people's lives. Um, am I correct that they had already started to distribute their machines to Walgreens? So no. So this is, the, the reason they were able to get away with this is they were exploiting this strange regulatory loophole. So in the United States, the Center of Medicaid and Medi-Cal Services is in charge of regulating patient processing. And the FDA is in charge of the distribution of medical devices. So in the Center of Medicaid and Medi-Cal Services, they allow you to have something called a laboratory developed test. And you don't have to get those approved for like six months until their development. So Theranos was claiming that they were in LDT, and they weren't actually distributed any of these devices, so uh, what they were allowed to do was just get the CLIA license and process patient samples. And that was their biggest defense, is that they were able, th they were legally doing this the right way. And so they were actually processing them correctly at that stage, not on their own machine. Is that yeah, the but uh, they, they weren't processing them correctly because things like LDTs were designed if you are a clinician and you don't want to pay as much for reagents, so for your chemicals. So instead of doing five milliliters, you'll decide to do 4.5 to save cost. That's really what the intention was, was to cover that. So they were kind of stretching the limits of what was allowed. And eventually they got caught because they were distributing the nanotainers, which were a medical device, which they didn't get approved. And, and they were doing some other stuff that they just weren't being very transparent about what was going on. I mean, it's phenomenal. The, the story is unbelievable. And I don't know how many of you have seen the HBO documentary, um, The Inventor. Yes, um, The Inventor. Out for Blood in Silicon Valley. Is yes. It? So it's made by Alex Gibney, who I'm an absolutely massive fan of. He's the guy who made Enron, the, uh, the smartest guys in the room. I'm sure people have seen it. What was the experience like of doing a documentary? I mean, you, you were this young woman, idealistic, went into Theranos, yeah. and now you're kind of on HBO documentaries and everything. What, what? Yeah, it <laughs> what was that like? It's been really surreal, to be honest, because I had never intended to go on the record, really, because I got pursued for a court case, I got subpoenaed, all my documentation went on to public record. Uh, that's, that's kind of why I went in, in, into the public. But um, now it's, it's been really interesting seeing the sort of story from my end of the sort of hype of everything where, you know, I felt like the lone soldier where I was like, oh, it's not what it's cracked up to be and then the kind of downfall of everything. But I, I think it's good because what I've realized is this, what happened at Theranos, though it's a sort of sensational and extreme case, there are a lot of people out there that resonate with the story because they've been put into similar circumstances. And so to be an ally to those people who are going through similar situations, I think is a pretty powerful thing. And I think that's the great thing about a movie like this is that there was actual heroes and, and slowly there is being justice. So hopefully other individuals that are in this situation, they can stand up and do something before it gets as bad as say a Theranos does. I have to ask you because I mean, I presume one of the things that would have appealed to you in the company as well is this incredible young woman, uh, you know, at a time when there was no, the next Steve Jobs always referred to a guy. Yeah. Suddenly we had Elizabeth Holmes. Was it sort of doubly disappointing to you that the first sort of 
big thing. All of it was disappointing. <laughs> really, it was all of it. It was all kind of, you know, it's it's all kind of just tragic in, yeah. in a way. Like, uh, just having so much of, there, there was so much about the mission of that company, you know, who Elizabeth Holmes was, the storyline that I really believed in and wanted to believe in and kind of when all that gets exposed, it's it's pretty painful. It's, it's not a fun process. I have to confess I was kind of horrified. <laughs> <laughs> I was going, oh God damn it, the one, you know, we finally have the female Steve Jobs. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think the one out. benefit we got out of this was Phyllis Gardner, though. So here is, you know, who should have been like Elizabeth Holmes. Like, she just wasn't hyped up, but she's had w numerous biotechnology companies. She's done all of these with a great amount of integrity and has influenced and impacted numerous scientists and female scientists. So, so hopefully, you know, we start to... The fact that we're so hungry for a strong yeah. female leader, we start... You know, le, le, you know, lifting up these ones that do exist, but maybe didn't get as much spotlight as they should have. And I mean, I've, I have a background in journalism and media myself, and they did not cover themselves in glory, I think it's fair to say. And it's interesting in the documentary how defensive and sort of embarrassed some of the very senior editors at Forbes and Fortune, et cetera. I mean, is there just too much hype in Silicon Valley? Is it just... Do, do they push so hard that you're... I, th I think with this one, I, it, there was just so much hype with her, and, and you just didn't anticipate that people would lie to that degree. Um, I mean, I, there was the heyday of the Silicon Valley, right? There were all these unicorn companies, there were just like Lyft, Uber, you know, all these new tech companies were coming out, so there was definitely a lot of excitement and enthusiasm. And maybe with everyone, they wanted, you know, they wanted strong female leaders. They wanted, you know, to support and, and highlight what seemed like a great technology. I don't think they thought it was hype. It was unfortunate. They thought it was true. Yeah. I think that's about, they're going to kill me backstage. I've broken my own rule. I'm, oh. just, so, I'm just so interested to talk to you. We're running over. So just one last question I do want to ask you because I, I, I stayed on Theranos there, but tell me a little bit more about the, the current. Um, yes. So we're a newly launched lot nonprofit and we're in the process of building basically an ethical toolkit to help train entrepreneurs on the five pillars, culture, fundraising, generating revenue, uh, building their products and hiring. And we're partnering with academics, chief ethics officers, and other experts in the field to, to make it easier for people to know how to deal with these issues if they stumble upon them. And where can people find out more about it? Ethics, uh, ethics in entrepreneurship at dot org. Fantastic. I, I'm going to leave it there. God, I could All talk right. to you for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Harry.